So I guess we can get started. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. And since this is lunch time, if you have food with you, feel free to eat. I don't know if they allow here, but I'm not going to tell. They don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't. Um, so, well, the schedule today is really quite tight because we have a lot of information to share with you. And uh, so, I, a quick introduction. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit, and then I'll let Dr. Skip. Uh, to talk to you, show, show you all the slides that he had prepared, just to talk about uh, some acoustical properties of the saxophone. And then really the project that we've been working on for the last couple of years, the initial idea was really quite simple. I want to be able to, in a lesson setting, to show the students what their sound looked like. A lot of times when we uh, work with the students, we play for them, right, as the teachers, and they will listen to it and try to emulate. But a lot of times, that is not enough. Some students just can't seem to get the idea. So I had the idea of, I want to show them, you know, the sound uh, uh, of their, their production and whether we can manipulate it that way. That's really, that's the, the whole idea. And I'll show you the program in a little bit. And uh, Dr. Skiff uh, is one of my colleagues at the University of Iowa at the Physics Department. And I always like to make fun of him because uh, his real job is to shoot lasers up to the space to measure plasma. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in the spare time, he, you know, acoustics is kind of his hobby. Uh, but he actually teaches a class uh, for, for undergraduate level acoustics. So. Well, I, I'll let him uh, carry on with the, with the acoustics part. Okay, yeah, so that was pretty stiff. And so the, uh, what I want to do, just before talking about the computer program that we wrote to try and visualize tone quality, is just to briefly fly through the, uh, some high points on the acoustical features of the saxophone. And there's really a lot of very interesting physics in the saxophone. So, and if you have questions, there will be time for Q&A at the end if you want to ask uh, some questions, I'd be happy to. So I'll just uh, you know, give a brief theory of sound and talk about the idea of reflections and modes and overtone series. The tonal cutoff is a very important uh, concept for this uh, lecture because uh, it turns out that this means that the player is very important for the uh, tone quality. I mean, it's not just the instrument, in fact, it's almost entirely player, particularly in the higher frequency ranges, and then talk about how these overtones appear. And, uh, so the basic thing, from a physics point of view, acoustics is a branch of mechanics, and so it's the study of force and motion. And so the two ingredients you need to understand the vibration of harmonic motion is there's some mass of matter that has inertia, and there's some force. And so the two ingredients you have are that the air has mass, about a kilogram, cubic meter, and it has uh, pressure, so 100,000 pascals. And so when you crunch air, then it pushes back. This is what I'm calling resilience. Put those two ingredients together, and what you find is that this, the speed of sound, it doesn't depend on the pitch at all. It just goes at about 700 and uh, a little over 700 miles an hour, or 340 meters a second. And uh, what's important here is that you have the frequency, what I show here, we were saying we should, should better have it. So all the law tag. <laughs> <laughs> this will do. Uh, so frequency times wavelength is the speed of sound. So what happens is, since the speed of sound is a constant, it mainly depends on the room conditions, and it depends on when your instrument warms up. What really matters is the, is the speed of sound in the air. In the so it's really the air warming up that's the critical thing. But if you have those conditions constant, then no matter what pitch you're playing, that, that will determine the wavelength because the frequency times the wavelength will be this constant number. So as you go to higher pitches, then the wavelengths are shorter. Okay? And for the saxophone, like many instruments, the wavelength is related to the length of the, of the instrument and, or the distance from the reed down to where you've got open tone holes. So sound is a wave, and so both in time, as you listen, 
you know, as time passes, and as you move away at a given moment in time, as you move around in space, there is this harmonic dependence of the force and the motion. So the graph on the top is the force, that's the change in the air pressure. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that, you know, in one, when I started uh, really uh, getting into acoustics and realizing just how amazing the human ear is, so at the threshold of human hearing, the change in the the change in the room pressure is incredibly small. So you have that one part in 10 to the 10th right, change. So that's one part in 10 billion of the atmospheric pressure is how much the ch pressure is changing. But it is changing, and that's the force which results in the motion shown on the bottom. And so there are small motions. Now these motions are also quite small. The motion of the air molecules is uh, uh, also about 10 billion of, say, the speed of sound. So, but, this shows the harmonic dependence, but of course now you put sound in the tube and amazingly you'll have, to a first approximation, these same uh, features that will travel at the same speed and it has this harmonic uh, dependence in space and time. But one thing that for a physicist is, is one of the amazing things about uh, instruments is that here you have a tube and the speed of sound is the same inside the tube as outside the tube. And yet, when the sound comes to the, so what I've drawn here is a kind of cartoon of a saxophone in blue, showing the bell here. And then the red are pressure, high, the high points of the pressure, which come periodically. And so your first thought would might be, well, the sound is flying down the tube and it just leaves, right? But it doesn't. What happens is, particularly if the wavelength of the sound, remember the wavelength is related to the frequency, and so, if the wavelength is long compared to this distance, so the wavelength is the distance, if that's big compared to the opening here, then we have a process uh, called uh, diffraction. And so when the sound wave comes to the end, it starts moving in a different pattern. And so, as I said, acoustics is the relationship between force and motion. And the ratio of force to motion, called the impedance, changes dramatically from the here and the two outside. When that happens, that is what, what causes a big reflection. So as loud as the, say, a saxophone sounds, the intensity of the sound is 100 times higher inside the instrument. Because most of the sound, when it comes to the end, ricochets and then goes back. And so this traps sound inside the instrument and makes these, the length of the instrument very important. And so as you go to higher and higher frequency, so what I'm showing here on this axis is frequency, the amount of reflection at lower frequencies, so the lower notes on your instrument, the sound reflects, you know, 99% of it reflects when it hits the end of the, the tube, and only a small amount is coming out. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, eventually, uh, more and more sound just flies out the end. And if you go to high enough frequencies, then the sound really does just fly out the end of the tube without reflecting at all. And that happens when the wavelength becomes short compared to the diameter of the horn. So the saxophone is an interesting instrument because the uh, you know if you take a tube and you do what I just said you but now you have to worry about what happens at the ends. I told you at the open end you get a reflection. Obviously, if you uh, close one end, you also get a reflection it's because the sound goes to a closed end and hits ricochets like ricocheting off a wall. And so this sets up what we call a moat inside the tube. And that mode has to have a very specific frequency because the wavelength just has to fit inside the, uh, the length of the tube. And so a half wave normally has to fit inside the tube. But if it's actually closed at one end and open at the other, you would have a quarter wavelength fitting in the tube being the lowest mode. And uh, then you would have what we have with the clarinet, is that you have only the odd overtones in the, in the uh, spectrum of the instrument. But the, Saxophone is a conical instrument, so that means it actually has a, it's a tube, but it's a tube which does not have a constant radius. And in fact, the opening angle of the saxophone is quite large, uh, relatively speaking. And so, what happens is that actually the modes, and what I'm showing here are the spatial variation of the modes, and you can see they're not quite this same uh, <coughs> sine wave or cosine wave show that I was showing you before. But the interesting net result is that you would get a fundamental, 
and then overtones, which are multiples of that fundamental. And this is the simplest theory, which just says they're purely multiples. In practice, it takes a lot of engineering of the instrument to get those overtones so that they're uh, close to being in multiples of the fundamental. So, that, this is laying the foundation. So the sound of the saxophone, its tone quality, has to do with the fact that it will have a fundamental and overtones. But uh, now, and I chose a good Scottish bottle of uh, beer here, there's another feature here that's very important for understanding uh, the saxophone. And that is that it has little holes in it that are open and closed to adjust the pitch. It also has thing, uh, a neck, often, which is a, an extended section which just slightly changes uh, the form of the tube. So it's not a pure cone right down to the very end. And not only that, the saxophone is attached to a player. So the player is uh, acoustically a whole series of chambers, which are pockets of air. And in physics, we call them Helmholtz oscillators. And they result in what we call a formant. So a formant is very important in uh, understanding human voice acoustics, but also uh, in understanding musical instruments. Any kind of innocent looking little uh, change in the, in the contour of the instrument can have acoustical consequences. And uh, so if you take a, a beer bottle like this and just blow over the top of it, you'll hear a note. Now if you then go to page one of my uh, talk and say, okay, frequency times wavelength equals the speed of sound, what you'll find is the wavelength associated with that note in the beer bottle is much bigger than the beer bottle. So what's going on is not a trapped mode like we have in the tubes of a, of a saxophone or a flute or something. What happens is you have what we call simple harmonic motion. You have a small pocket of air, and it's, and it's just confined enough that it defines a mass and a spring. So the air in the pocket is the spring, and the air that moves in and out of the mouth of the pocket is the mass. And so you can use the standard formula we have in physics for simple harmonic motion. And what you find is that the pitch of a bottle, and you can try this, it works very well. You just measure the area of the net of the opening. So area is, say, square centimeters of the um, uh, opening of the top of the, of the net. Then measure the length of the net. And then measure the volume in the bottom part of the bottle. We call that V. So these are three things. You put them into this formula, and it'll tell you the pitch. Now, what this means is, so the, in the human vocal tract, there are several forms, in the, both in the nasal cavities and also in various parts of your mouth and throat. And in singing, people tune them when they move their tongue around and change the tension in the walls of their uh, vocal tract. And this happens also when people are playing saxophone. And this has very important consequences that we'll return to. But the uh, the holes in the side, the tone holes are also little tiny Helmholtz oscillators, but all they do is actually just slightly shift the pitch of the of the note in that case. But the um, okay, so I'm flying through quite a bit of stuff, but feel free to ask questions later. So I had to put down a wave equation, the physicist. But basically, what happens is when you want to try to understand the saxophone, you have to understand you've got this tube, and of course I've still kept it straight, but it's actually conical. And it's got holes in it. And then you get reflections, not only from the end, but from each of the holes. And so then you can compose a uh, description of the whole instrument, and you find a rather interesting result. It's called the tone hole cutoff. Is that, I told you that you have modes in a tube, and they're the, the uh, waves that correspond to the waves that just fit in the tube. And there are an infinite number in principle of those because you can just make the wavelengths shorter and then you fit, say, a half or one full wavelength or one and a half wavelengths or uh, three half wavelengths and go, keep it going. But, and so in principle, if you had a simple pipe, you would have a picture like this. Now this picture is what we call a resonance curve. It, it, it shows the acoustic resonances of, in this case, a tube of finite length. And this axis here is a frequency axis, so the pitch. And so what you see is a strong resonance at the fundamental, and then these things are the overtones. And eventually, you can see that these peaks get smaller and, and broader. And that is where, uh, due to the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that as you go to higher and higher frequencies, eventually there's not much of a reflection from the tube, and the mode doesn't uh, 
really really well defined. So the stronger the reflections, the stronger the, the resonance. And so you normally find this behavior, but now when you put in a bunch of tone holes, what you find is that this series of overtones just stops. Them. Okay. Not only that, you'll the the location of these uh, peaks is slightly not where you'd expect them to be. They're not quite exactly multiples of the fundamental. So uh, that uh, has important consequences. So there's been actually quite a bit of research, and I'm just I have one. Hope you can see that uh, paper there, which is a, a very recent work on this uh, saxophone acoustics. And so what I've drawn here now is the tone hole cutoff, and then a the uh, formant resonance of a human voice to someone who's playing in a uh, altissimo range. In other words, out beyond where the instrument above the second register, above normally where you play. And in this case, what, what it actually ends up sounding is not one of the resonances of the instrument itself, but something completely controlled by the vocal tract of, of the player. So in between, this is an extreme case. But in, in between, even when they're, you're playing notes that are in fact uh, controlled by the lower registers of the, of the instrument, the, the resonance due to the vocal tract performance of the uh, player, in other words, all those little pockets of air, have, it, have a large effect on the tone quality because, so, it controls the overtones. So what I've shown here, this is a kind of a summary of a lot of data from an old paper. Uh, this is uh, the amplitude of different pitches, and what, the only thing I want you to get from this is that Gee, this is an interesting plot that where the points seem to lie on one line, then there's a break point there, and then they lie on a different line. And that line is sloping downward. Now that point in the middle is the, is the tone hole cutoff. And you might ask, why should there be sounds out beyond, beyond the tone hole cutoff anyway? Because the instrument doesn't have modes out there. There's nothing. And these are produced by the reed, combination of the reed and the player and they're controlled completely by the reed and the player. And so this is uh, the part where the, the player control has a huge amount of control over the tone quality. One quick question. What's yes. the y-axis? This was the intensity. So component level means these are the overtones of uh, some of notes. And actually on here are a whole bunch of different notes that are played, so a whole bunch of different fundamentals. So it's kind of a compendium of the so each note you would play would actually have an equally spaced series of points contributing to this plot, which is our its fundamental and the power in each of its overtones. And so this is kind of a, a summary plot of a lot of uh, data, where a lot of notes have been played, and then you say, well, generally, what kind of law does the instrument follow? Okay? And what you find is that at below the tone hole cutoff, you actually have a you know a fairly on this is looking flat, and back to it looks like the power tends to increase uh, with the higher overtones, or as you're going up to higher notes. But then it's uh, the relative power in the overtones really takes a starts to decrease radically after you exceed the tonal cutoff frequency. So that's not just saying the higher you're playing, the softer you're playing. No, the how loud you're playing has been completely removed from this. So this is loud is an intensity. It is, but this is relative intensity. So what I'm doing is I'm, I, I, I say, look, let's just normalize, in other words, divide everything according to just how loud the movie is, okay? And because what I'm interested in this plot is not how loud or how soft the play. What I'm interested in is the tone quality, which is giving you how a certain amplitude, a certain loudness is fundamental. What is the relative loudness of all the overtones? That's what I'm looking at. And so that's why it falls on a simple, simple, Rule because otherwise it would, you know, you be all over the place. So this this has to do with so the slower part really has to do with how the instrument is built, okay? And that's something you don't have a lot of control over when you're playing this. But my point is that this does change, all right? Uh, and so there you'll notice there's more scattering points here, even though the person was trying to maintain you know constant tone call. But that's we'll come back to that. 
So I don't have a lot of time to be. So from a physics point of view, to read is a nonlinear value and it has a lot of important consequences, which, you know, <coughs> so you could model how a saxophone works and come up with, I think, a, a reasonably good model. And maybe I'll, I'll just skip over that and get into, so really the point of this first part was just simply to try to lay the foundation, just make a fast flyover. Uh, so we could really easily talk for an hour just on the physics of the, of the saxophone. But is to lay the foundation for what we want to talk about, which is this program where we try to then come up with a visual, it's really kind of a visual feedback. So if you're having difficulty hearing your sound, then this is a tool that will enable you to see uh, what your sound is doing and compare it to another sound, say the instructor plays a note and then uh, the student can play a note and see if they can reproduce the tone form. And there are a number of elements of this, but we'll just stick to the, the basics. So the, um, yeah, so there's an interesting kind of uh, mathematical technique used for figuring out where these high overtones come when they're not coming from modes in the instrument. They're coming from the reed and then from the nonlinearity, nonlinearity in the reed, which is controlled also by the player. And so I can quantify this, and I didn't, haven't seen anyone do that. But anyway, so there are a number of things that I look at. The basic thing that's going to go to this uh, probe is the power and all the overtones. And then their interrelationship. They actually come from one another. And that uh, nonlinear relationship is also quantified. Okay. And so the idea, though, is to make the program, and it's not quite in its final form yet, because I'll, there are more knobs on it in what you'll see because I want to be able to play with the knobs during my talk. But the idea is ultimately to reduce this to a simple interface so you don't have to know any of that mathematics or any of that to, know, to use it. Right? That's the, the ultimate goal. But here, just for your... Uh, so I think what we'll do now is uh, transition to the, the panel. Yeah, so... Yeah, if you want to make some comments, right. again. Yeah, just a quick few quick comments. Uh, really, the couple of things that, you know, from all this, to show that, you know, what a genius Adolf Sachs was, you know, because there was no study of this until probably late 19th century, if not later. I mean, all those equations, all those, so what Adolf Sachs had was just hammer and chisels and whatever, and then test trials and errors. It's just incredible. I mean, you have to imagine hours and years of uh, 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 test in order to come up with what we have today. I mean, it's really quite, quite amazing. And so the, um, uh, the second thing is the upper range. Now by upper range, I mean, I think, uh, most of the second register and above, up to altissimo. Really, uh, uh, the tone quality is completely controlled by the player. And I think we all know this by now, I mean by today, uh, everybody knows this, but I, I feel that we're not taking the complete advantage of that control. Uh, and we'll, we'll show you in, in, in a minute. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, you have nobody to blame but, but yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And so the, the, when I first started, I wanted, we actually bought many uh, uh, spectrogram or uh, software for already exist today and try to measure the sound. But what I found was that it's just too complicated for our use. I mean, we're just simple musicians. We, we were okay with simple graphs and, and all those, but those spectra are just too complicated for measuring concert hall and all those. And so I, what I want is I had the idea and I just throw it to the scientist and he takes care of the rest. I want a program that can show me exactly uh, the, the um, different harmonics or the strength or the weakness of different harmonics. I think from, from this uh, presentation, by definition, the more harmonics you can create, the more, uh, uh, the better tone quality we perceive. Now, Dr. Skip doesn't like that uh, simplification uh, uh, idea because for scientists, they, you know, they can all, all, all kinds of data, but for me, I'm okay. <laughs> Okay, we're just simple saying that the more the, the, the harmonics, stronger harmonics we get, the more we perceive as, as a, a better sound. And that's, I think, to me, that's why people in 
enjoy listening to jazz playing because the jazz players they really uh, garner a lot of uh, uh, power playing with you know the volume and also really garner all the, the, the harmonics in the sound and make it sound great. So to our ears we feel like slipping in a warm bath kind of feeling. Okay, so that's what what I want to do uh, uh, when I teach and. and pick on a student is to get that feeling in our, in our, in our ears. So, uh, without delaying too, too much, if you want to show yeah. okay. So, you want to show the linear graph first? Or? Yeah, let me just do that. So. so, another thing that I want to make sure that we can do, this is not, by the way, not the final product yet. We still have some things to do, and hopefully, uh, we are toying with the idea of making it into an app um, for, for people, hopefully, uh, uh, later. And it will be much, much more simplified than this. Um, and also, we don't want to have complicated audio equipment. So if you have a computer has a, a laptop or, or you know, iPad or iPhone has a just internal microphone, you can use that to analyze your sound. So, yeah, so why don't you just play it? Which again is not really the most, is going to be the, probably the least helpful in terms of tone quality. You see he's playing a constant note, and you can see the harmonic vibration. He's played a fairly uh, you know, sinusoidal uh, note. True. Sorry? No, no, no. Yeah. The, um, <coughs> the next way we look at it, and this is again sort of recapping when we looked at what the software that was out there, it was mostly. And what you find is 
that what these plots, they're, they're lying right on top of each other. What that means is that even though the instrument's modes are not pure, they're not perfect, if you, no matter how well they try to make the instrument, the overtone the instrument itself are not perfectly aligned. But when the player plays it, this nonlinear process at the reed locks them in, and so they are precisely uh, multiples of the fundamental. I mean, to, you know, and that's just an a indicator of how they're being produced. They're not just there because the instrument has modes out there, they're there because of the, the reed and the player producing them through this nonlinear process. So, all right, so the next thing would be. Can we do the bombs? Yeah. So this is really to me the, the meat of the program. And this uh, I want to make sure that um you can not quite I will do the box. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so now. So um well let me record this and I'll show you what we're doing. So what these bars, that one on the left hand side is the fundamentals, the main note, and then these are the harmonics. Can we show eight of them? Uh, yeah, sure, we can do it again. And you can choose, uh, in this program eventually, you can choose how many harmonics you want to show. So the, uh, the second one with the octave, and you see that there's two colors, right? Red and blue. Okay. So if you are the teacher and you want to want the student to emulate you, want to sound like you, okay, then you can record a, a reference tone. Now again, you have to define what you want the student to sound like. I'm not, I, I, I don't want to risk to, to tell you what is a good sound, what is a bad sound, okay? But, you know, as a teacher, then you can record. Let's assume that that's the, what, can we record the number? We'll do another one, so if you want to eight, yeah. So let's say this is the reference sound. And then the next step would be, you ask the student to play. And let's say I'm the student now, and I'm going to play. And I play.
overtones and uh, it, you know the signals and noise of the so if you don't have much power in the high overtones then it's going to have difficulty you know comparing mm -hmm. so it has to you need to then choose the number of overtones that really makes sense for what you're doing and so I'm not sure how we may have tried to automate that in the future right. but you know if, if so if the instructor ha has a sound without much power in certain overtones then you don't want to divide by something So can we do the maybe the vibrato? Um, yeah. So that one. So another function that uh, we could implement is to show you know whether your vibrato is you know even. Um, so let's see. We can just do a test tone.
you see that oh it's pretty even and can hear it. So again the goal is to be able to both hear and see the sound. And it lets it, uh, very quickly. Um, yeah, and this is the same thing with the amplitude. Mm -hmm. The Yeah, maybe just to, before opening up the question, because we want to do some talk for Q&A, right? Yeah. But, uh, so what, what I have here is just actually even just raw overtone amplitudes uh, taken with, and, what, and we, we did a number of experiments where basically he had words that he used to describe sound, either like warm and cold or thick and thin. So and to me, the idea was, well, let's see what that means, right? And it does mean something in terms of the overtones, and so you can, we can quantify. So he did three different kinds of sound here. And you can see they, they vary from having more power in the higher overtones than in the fundamental to you know, varying differences. And so what's here are, are uh, error bars over just a, a very brief clip. So already you can start to see a statistically significant difference between uh, the different kinds of, you know, what he describes as sound with different words. The other thing was that kind of an interesting side which I don't know yet exactly what's going on, but just by, by with this sort of a medium sound, by adding vibrato, it also it didn't just add vibrato, it also changed the power in the overtone. So again, this kind of clock is showing overtones, that's a fundamental, and then that's an octave, and that's an octave and a fifth, that's two octaves. And so these are over, the frequencies of overtones, and the power, uh, in them changes, but this change happened just from saying, well, now just add a slight vibrato. So there's a, the two things are coupled uh, in some way. Whereas adding vibrato to other notes didn't seem to, so when you already have what you call a wide sound, which I'm not sure what that, but you know, it's a kind of a qualitative word to describe the sound. But suffice it to say that there's certain kinds of tone, uh, playing, you know, tone quality, which when you add the vibrato, then it doesn't really change. So again, you know, these are some of the words that we use every day when we teach, right? You know, it's too warm, too wide, too, what does it mean? Uh, it's too abstract, really. So in this case, we can, we can see it. Um, and I think some people have asked before, like, so can I play like a Charlie Parker recording or Lake and just show it on a graph and so I can try to emulate that? And, and that's, obviously we could do that, but it's not the goal of this. Because I believe that when you build tone quality, it's really one note at a time. Because each note is, is really a habit building. So when you build that, so we're not trying to you know, have a whole lake and then you're trying to copy uh, the sound. Okay? So, we have five minutes. So, for you to open it up for questions in case there so Obviously, again, this is not the final product. So hopefully we'll have more updates in, in the future. And, you might see it in iTunes. Yes? I've done something similar to this with an old stroke, uh, Tom Stroke Turner. You've done that? You stop the wheel. Uh -huh. We used to use those tune, but there are, I don't know how many of those are on. But you could stop. If you change your tone quality, you can stop. You can use that for tuning. You can use it just to, to identify the frequency, right? Uh, but to uh, uh, work on tone quality, Strengthen some of the overtones by changing your overtones. But you only see one. It's usually the stroke, you're just, you're just locking in on the fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. It, the old Peterson stroke here, which shows the overtones. Oh, really? Okay, so yeah, I'm not familiar with that device. Oh, Sarah's well out of date. <laughs> Peterson? It, yeah, and they still make them, but they're. There's something like $2,000 for that model, so no music. So that's, that's a very good point, because again, some of the software we looked at, they're like a thousand now. You know, it's not possible for even the teacher, unfortunately, to buy such a software. Right? So, you know, I, I want something like this to be either free or, you know, um, maybe. <laughs> free or, or really, really cheap that you can get it, very cheap. Yeah, because this, I mean, you know, they, they, Cost me anything really to deploy it because I can, the software, I'm licensed, you know, I can uh, distribute it without needing you know, any kind of licensing. So, can, and you're teaching, yes. 
do you find that it's possible for a student to achieve the same picture in a way that you don't want them to contort their own shirt or own um, Could you explain more of the question? You Are there multiple ways to achieve the same picture? Yes, that's a very good question. So, uh, and this is not to replace the teacher, obviously. Uh, you can show them, but the teacher will have to make sure that the student is not doing something funny right. to get the same picture. Right. That's an excellent point, yes. No, yeah. It's just a tool to help the teacher, not to replace it. And that's something where, I mean, obviously when we part of it, once we, you know, uh, package it more, we just deploy it in the sense of just have people try it out and see what kind of issues. So that's fairly subtle. I mean, conceivably, the, the belief would be that, if, you know, for many nodes and things, you wouldn't be able to do something strange to, uh, you know, to mimic it. So, and, and one thing, the difference between the classical and the jazz world is, is for the classical, we have to manipulate as little as possible with our embouchure, but in the oral cavity. For jazz musicians, they, to achieve the sound that they want, they manipulate a lot more things, you know, to do that. But yeah, for classical, it's a different, different enemy. I'll ask you a question because I'm on staff and all this stuff. Could a saxophonist use this program to help choose a new instrument or a reed or a mouthpiece or something like that? Well, I mean, I think that the, yeah, I mean, I think that you might, I think that the part of the message that we have here really is that a lot of what we're trying to evaluate is the player's uh, contribution and not so much evaluate the instrument, although I think that if there was something effective about the reed, uh, that, would, that would have pretty quick yeah, problems so with consoles in these uh, spectra. But, uh, you know, so... I, I, would as, I would assume if you have more overtones, you can add more overtones and really see the, the detail differences between the different hard pieces. I haven't tried that. That's a yeah. good, good point. Yeah, I, we, we might be able to use, use that. But yeah, the, the, really the goal is to teach the student to manipulate get a good, good sound, whatever the teacher wants to test it to sound. I mean, I, see, I sort of see this like, you know, for a sports person doing push-ups, you know, it's not going to be a replacement for a lot of the art, you know, that, what they do, but the idea is, and you can and you just hear the differences in sound between different sounds, and then that is being able to control the, you know, what the program is recording is a kind of exercise that if you can do that, then you can, you know, you, you have something. Yes. Again, with, when you were making these recordings, and say you had a bad reading day, could you see a difference in the overtones if you had a bad reading? I, I would think so, but we haven't actually done that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the thing is, the read is quite crucial.
hopefully within a year, maybe. Yeah. On when you are kind of into the artisan register, yeah. is it kind of, is the processing you're using, presumably it's just like theory of transforms and MATLAB or something, but is it sensitive enough to still plot, say, eight harmonics up if you're already kind of up around the top of the zap? Is it what yeah, sort no, of Well, that's, that's a question it, maybe about the sound card and yeah. about you know, the quality of your built-in microphone. I mean, at some point, but most, you know, uh, of these uh, devices work over the entire range of human hearing. And you can, you know, you can have a sample frequency that's in the kilohertz. So that's, you can actually, but eventually you would, uh, well, you have to make sure. I, that's another parameter that can be set in the program is the sample, right? As long as your sound card is you know, able to do it. Uh, so, but, you know, in overtones that are above, you know, 40 kilohertz, probably, you know, not going to be heard by right? itself. So, but I don't think we have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Even on Supreme. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think the hardware now, it's even on very crude you know, devices, they have pretty high performance sound. Okay. Yeah, I didn't understand, I came in late, I apologize. I didn't understand the discussion of the tone will cut off. Where does that occur in saxophone range? It's about 618 hertz, so it's quite low. It's amazing, be. and it's partly because it happens that way in the... Where's that in the saxophone range? The full volume would be 8, right? It's 618 would be 8. Oh, calculator fast. <laughs> C sharp is a 660, so it would be, so be, be between A, between these, these three notes. So anything, so you're saying that anything above A, you are in the driver's seat. That's really, so it's not a mode of the instrument at that point. It's being generated by the nonlinear process of the read and play. Roughly, yeah, that's the you output know, in output. For the output. Yeah, so it's a little higher. And it's partly because of the, the large cone angle of the saxophone that that's the case. So it's a, it's a little bit different. <coughs> With the, the clarinet, you actually get have more modes defined by the instrument, even though it's only it's the output. Only about a degree and a half, and a half an angle. Well, we'll go to that. Let people go. Well, thanks for coming. If you have any questions, we will still be here for a few minutes.